Hello, I am Mihai Marusak from Google and I will be talking about how we enhance TensorFlow security, basically how we are going to construct a secure ML framework. To begin with, about me, I am a software engineer at Google for almost four years. I am a member of the TensorFlow open source developer infrastructure and security team, being a team lead for the security pillar. Uh, outside of work, I'm interested also in differential privacy and Haskell, and on the side you also see my socials. And about TensorFlow, it's uh, one of the end-to-end -end open source platform for machine learning from Google. It has a very vibrant ecosystem, uh, has over 100 packages, some tools, some libraries built around it. Uh, it aims to help both researchers to enhance the state of the art in machine learning and also developers to build and deploy machine learning powered applications on a variety of platforms. And now the question is, why does TensorFlow need security? In the end, TensorFlow is a machine learning library. It doesn't store secrets. It doesn't do any password, any logins. It doesn't do any cryptography. In the end, machine learning is just, it's mostly linear algebra. So the question arises, does linear algebra need security? And actually, if we look more at what TensorFlow does, we see that it also handles some production requirements. We have the case where a model needs to be deployed on a large production environment to actually be useful, to be used in production. We have large models that need to distribute their computation across several computational nodes. We have the scenario where one application uses multiple models and depending on the input, switches from one model to the other. So we have the requirement to be able to serve multi multiple models at the same place. And finally, we have the scenario of embedded systems Right now, a lot of the Pixel phones, when you say, okay, Google, for example, they are using TensorFlow. Actually, a variant of TensorFlow called TensorFlow Lite, but it resides in the same repository. Uh, at the bottom, TensorFlow models are programs. And basically, each TensorFlow model is a set of computational graphs. So after you write your code in Python and you train the model, in the end, everything results into a graph that the execution engine, the execution framework, would uh, start executing. Uh, each parameter of a model is stored in uh, checkpoints. We'll discuss a little bit more about this later. And each node in the graph can do computation. And some of the nodes can be very powerful. So for example, they can write to disk, they can read from disk, they can create new processes, they can send data over network, and they even each, each node can even run on different uh, architectures. So, so some of the nodes can run on CPU, some of them can run on GPU, some of them can run on a totally separate computer, and so on. In the latest version of TensorFlow, even the parameters can be distributed with uh, distributed tensors such that large-scale models are supported. So now let's focus on the computation nodes. They can be either directly defined into the TensorFlow repository, or they can be operations defined by users from outside of the repository and load it as plugins. Let's first focus on the plugins, on the user-defined ops, and then we'll also discuss the other scenarios. Each operation in TensorFlow has both mandatory components and optional components. The optional components are useful for speeding up learning or for distribution and testing and so on but the mandatory components are needed such that a user can then use this operation. And from these mandatory components, we have the Python glue, such that you can use it from Python, since TensorFlow is mainly a Python framework. We have the C++ op registration, basically the link between the Python API and the, ex the piece of code that will be executed at runtime. And finally, the runtime piece, the C++ kernel. The Python glue and the C++ op registration, usually they are just calling some macros or some simple template function, and it's easy. The C++ kernel on the other side is where the entire computation happens. So let's focus a little bit more on that. So here I have an example of defining a custom op where it's implemented as a class, my op, and it inherits from the class op kernel. And in the end, I have to do two operations. One is to call the constructor and make sure I also call the op kernel constructor. And the other place is the compute method where the entire computation happens. So here I am reading the input tensors, I am operating on those tensors, 
I am putting output I'm putting numbers or values into the output tensor and then I'm returning since this custom op is written by users there are scenarios where we don't really trust the code that is written in there but even if we disallow custom ops in our uh, infrastructure and we say we only want to use ops that exist in TensorFlow, the primitive ops, even those are not always safe. So for example, TensorFlow ships with an operation called parse tensor op, which is able to take a protobuf, a protocol buffer serialization of a tensor, and expand it into memory into a full tensor. The problem with this operation is that there are scenarios where very small protobufs, so for example one of 60 bytes, 16 bytes, can result in a very large RAM allocation. So in our scenario, over 64 gigabytes of RAM. For this, to prevent scenarios where this could result into a denial of service attack, there is the option to add the operation to allow list or to block lists and so on into TensorFlow. So a user that is con security conscious before running the save model, they would uh, run a tool, a save model CLI, to scan what operations exist in TensorFlow, what are their capabilities, and then they would decide if they want to run the model or not. Finally, let's focus at a higher level. So now I have the model that uses multiple ops, and first I need to train the model on some data. Because the training can take a long time, Sometimes I want to save the status of the training and just in case the, something happens and the training gets interrupted or I need to restart it with some other parameters and so on. If I save the state of the model during training, that is creating a checkpoint. So here I'm only serializing the parameters, the computation nodes, so basically the computation graph stays the same. After the training completes, I have the option to save the entire model into a saved model which contains both the parameters and the entire computational graph, serialized as a protocol buffer. And then at inference, so when I want to use this model into production, I can load the model and the parameters from the save model directory, or I can load the model from a save model and the parameters from, a other, from another checkpoint. This way I could train the model, and then at inference I would load the model with the parameters that, from the checkpoint that gave the best accuracy during training. The issue here is that both the checkpoints and the state models are safe to disk and this is a feature because it allows you to easily share these outside of TensorFlow but they open us to a possibility of time of check, time of use attack where I save the model on my computer, I send them to you but before you get to use them, someone alters them and now they do something else. So I can give an example, suppose I have this model where I have two functions, f1 and f2 F1 just does a multiplication by 17, F2 does calls a malicious operation. And then the model uses an if, if x is less than y equals F1, otherwise it calls F2. Assume that when you scan the model, you detect that x is always less than y, but now when you restore the model from the checkpoint, the user flips the conditions. And now when you are trying to use this model later, Instead of executing the multiplication, it's going to execute the malicious operation. Finally, let's move on. Let's consider now that we've trusted the model completely. We know exactly that it was produced in-house, it never got altered, it's perfect. However, even in this scenario, the data can be untrusted. So, most of the models operate on images, on audio, and so on. Each of these can be altered, can be maliciously modified to exploit flaws in, uh, in parsing, for example, or to trigger large allocations or large computation and so on. Or they can even be altered to just skew the prediction labels. This is the scenario of adversarial learning, for example. And a, mo a small caveat here, TensorFlow has over 100 for party dependencies, so we also need to be careful about the vulnerabilities in those dependencies and how TensorFlow can be made to not trigger those. Okay, now that I discussed what are the reasons why TensorFlow needs security, let's discuss how we do the security. So on GitHub we have the security policy file where we describe some general advice for people to use TensorFlow in a secure mode. So basically, treating all of the models as code. If you download the model from the internet, 
don't run it directly, maybe sandbox it. Uh, if you have a system that handles untrusted input, try to separate the, the parts that does the input parsing from the rest of the system. Then use allow list and block list for ops to prevent executing dangerous ops, and so on. Also in the security policy, we describe what we consider a security vulnerability. In general, we provide no guarantee for full-party ill-defined models, but even perfectly valid models can be exploited, and we have handled around 500 vulnerabilities in the past four years, and some of them have been unwanted side effects, like changing the output of a function, creating another file on the disk, and so on. But we also had cases where the process would exit in an unclean way, like an assertion failure or so on, or a segmentation fault, or we had cases where the memory contents has been leaked and this can, could be used to bypass uh, uh, security policies like AS ASLR. And all of this could be used for future gadgets to create uh, even more powerful attacks against systems that use TensorFlow. So how do we ensure that TensorFlow is secure? We have several options, and they are listed here somehow in the order of uh, frequency and how we employ them. And I'll go through all of them one by one. So let's begin first with fuzzing. In order to begin with fuzzing, we have to consider first the dichotomy between unit testing and random testing. In general, in unit testing, you are testing the API with some fixed input and testing some property of the output, usually that the output is equal to what you expect. The problem here is that you are only testing exactly the input-output pairs that you thought of when you wrote the unit test. With random testing, for a period of time, you run your API with random input, and you can check some properties between the input and the output. For example, if I'm testing an API that adds two tensors, one property that I could test is that addition is commutative assuming integers. Fuzzing is similar to property testing, except here what I care about is, is the system secure? The system doesn't have crashes. The boundary between fuzzing and property testing is fuzzy. Okay. There are two ways to generate the inputs for fuzzers or rand for random testing. One is coverage base, where a the system looks at how much coverage into the binary, how, much, how many branches, how many conditions have been considered, and tries to generate the new random API, the new random input to steer the execution towards areas that haven't been touched. There is also generational uh, random input generation, where basically uh, the system uses some genetic algorithms to try to get as deep as possible into the input. Fuzzers are usually coupled with sanitizers, so address sanitizer, memory sanitizer, thread sanitizers, to detect more issues, more security issues ahead of time. Uh, fuzzing has been called the new unit testing because it discovers much, uh, many, many more bugs compared to unit testing, and it has several trophies where it discovered vulnerabilities in open source software, for example, Heartbleed from OpenSSL, or more recently, the pseudo vulnerability, both of them, have been discovered via fuzzing. In fact, for TensorFlow, out of all those almost 500 uh, code weaknesses that we identified, over 400 of them have been discovered via fuzzing. Uh, what can fuzzing find? Usually anything that a sanitizer can detect, so memory underflows and overflows, uh, invalid memory pa access patterns, memory leaks, undefined behavior, as the C++ standard is wide, it's very easy to trigger undefined behavior, and if you just use one single compiler, you are not going to detect it. Fuzzing can also detect crashes that could then be used to generate denial of service attacks. They can detect uh, bugs in using resources. We have scenarios where fuzzing would discover, for example, uh, denial of service because two functions in the TensorFlow model were, exp were waiting on the same lock, or they were calling each other recursively without reducing the input, so it was like an infinite loop. Fuzzing can discover arithmetic bugs. We have a lot of division by zeros and overflows in TensorFlow code that have been discovered by fuzzing. Uh, 
Uh, they can discover faulty assertions when the code was written and broken invariants as the code migrates. So there is, it's a common knowledge that TensorFlow 1.x has been using the graph mode, so the graph uh, API. So when you are writing a model, you would describe the entire computation graph and then later you would pass the inputs. Whereas TensorFlow 2 APIs are eager mode. You can debug what happens after each operation. You can print tensors during the program and so on. The problem is the switch from TensorFlow 1 to TensorFlow 2 has uncovered multiple invariants where people were assuming that their code would always pass through the graph generation phase. And now because in eager mode that no longer executes, there are some assertions, some validations that are no longer executed. Finally, fuzzing or property testing, they can find property failures or round trip failures where, for example, you take an input, you encrypt it, you decrypt it, and you're expecting to see the same thing. Uh, a good fuzzer has to consume any type of input, and in this case, I mean, the size of the input should be small, large, even empty inputs, and should cleanly exit on invalid data. So if your program under a fuzzer, under a random input crashes, that would both slow down the fuzzer and will also signal that that input could be used to trigger a denial of service later by an attacker passing it to crash your program in a production environment. Uh, fuzzers should be deterministic because we want, once we get a crash, we want to minimize the input and keep repeating, keep debugging it. A good fuzzing library allows the input that triggered the fuzzing crash to also be used as a unit test uh, later. So if the fuzzer is deterministic, you can easily take the input and make it as a unit test and only te test for regressions when once the bug is fixed, it no longer gets reintroduced. Fuzzers should minimize the use of global state because it makes uh, easier to fuzz your code. It's better if they run in a single process and they are fast because then you get to cover more parts of your co program in as little time as possible. Okay, so TensorFlow uses open source fuzz to fuzz the open source uh, version of TensorFlow. This is a project developed by Google, separate of TensorFlow, and we've integrated since 2018. Basically, the process has several steps. First, the developer writes some fuzzers in the upstream project, in our case, TensorFlow, and also commits a small configuration to the Google OSS fuzz repository. The configuration basically specifies what is the build script to build the fuzzers, and who to notify in case of uh, issues. Then there is automation that synchronizes the upstream project to build it on OSS fuzz infrastructure and uploads the build fuzzers to a Google Cloud uh, storage bucket. Separately, cluster fuzz, a separate fuzzing infrastructure, downloads the fuzzers from Google and the corpus, executes uh, the fuzzer for a period of time, and file bugs whenever it discovers them. Separately, cluster fuzz also verifies fixes for these bugs. Once a bug is, fi is filed in uh, monorail, this is the issue tracker that gets used, the developer is notified and they usually have 30 days up to 60 days to fix the issue before the bug becomes public. If the developer fixes the issue before this 30 days period expires, the bugs become public immediately. And tracking all of these deadlines is done by another piece of infrastructure called SheriffBot. Okay, so this is an example of how we do fuzzing in TensorFlow. I mean, fuzzing with uh, LLVM fuzzer. Basically, what we have to define is this function, LLVM fuzzer test one input, which has two arguments, a buffer called data and the size of the buffer. And this buffer is basically the random data, the random input that is given to the fuzzer. And we call the API with this buffer and its size. TensorFlow uses Bazel for building. So we also have to write a build file, in which case we use a CCFast target macro that already exists. There is nothing else that we have to do. Okay, now let's see some more examples. We also have support for fuzzing a TensorFlow via Python where the output is all, the process is almost similar. We set up the Ateris fuzzer, uh, where we pass the function that receives the buffer, the random input, and does something with that. 
and then we call the fuzz function from a terrace. Okay, in TensorFlow, since most of the models are computational graphs, we need to first create a fuzz session where we build a computation graph, we create the tensor for the inputs, and then the fuzzing part would be just filling in the tensors, running the computation graph, and getting out the output. F to simplify all of this process, we create this fuzz session class where we have a virtual function to build the graph and a virtual function to do the fuzzing. And then there are helper functions, run inputs and fuzz and so on, that could be used. A lot of the operations in TensorFlow have one input and one output. So for these cases, we subclass fuzz session to fuzz string input op. So for example, if you are parsing a string or an image, this would be the class that we would be using. Finally, also to simplify the process of writing fuzzers in TensorFlow, we have two macros. One of them is standard TFuzz functions, which is the macro that writes the LLVM fuzzer test one input, basically creates a class and calls the fuzz method from the class. And the second one is called single input op builder, which builds a computation graph that has one input and one output. So with all of these helpers, this is the simplest fuzzer, the simplest fuzz that we can write in TensorFlow. It's a fuzzer for the code BMP, which takes the input of a BMP image and fuzzes it with the BMP parser using the decode BMP kernel operation in TensorFlow. We have more complicated examples. So in this case, suppose I have an operation that has multiple inputs. So I have four inputs, input depth on and off. In build graph, I just construct all of these uh, place, I construct placeholders for all of these tensors and I call the one hot, that is the operation that I want to fuzz with those parameters. And then in fuzz implementation, I take the data that is given to me by the fuzzer, the random buffer, and I am going to split it up such that I can fill all four tensors. And this is the part of setup tensors that I will show on the next slide. So here, when we have to split the input, we can do it manually. So we can check, for example, if the size of the buffer is greater than three, the depth is the first element of the buffer, the on tensor is the second element of the buffer, the off value is the third one, and then everything else is the size of the input. Otherwise, I use some constants and then I fill in the tensors. There are other ways to handle the complex inputs. So what I used in the previous slides was a custom format because it was specifically tailored for that operation. There is also the possibility to write multiple fast targets for the same API. So for example, if the API has a flag that could be true or false or from a, specific, from a small set of values, it might be easier to write one fuzzer for each value of, the, of the, that flag. So I could write one fuzzer for where this argument is always set to true and another one where this argument is set to false. There is also the option to embed secondary inputs in the comment field. So for example, if I am parsing an image, I can use the comment fields in the image format to pass arguments for the other parts of the fuzzer that uses the image. There is also the option to use the first or the last bytes of the buffer, which is exactly what we did before, or to use the magic separator and then use memmem -mem function to find the, sorry, to find the separator inside the API. There are also formats that are more general and more engineering based. So one of them is to use the fast data provider class, which I will go over in the next slides, or to encode the complex input either using a type length value pair. So I specify the input has this type, uh, has uh, this length, and then the value of the input, and then continue, so on and so on. Or to use protobuf mutators. Basically, I am building the input as a protobuf, and then the protobuf mutator, which already is implemented by the fuzzing infrastructure, mutates this protobuf, and then my fuzzer would read from the protobuf, would expand everything, deserialize everything, and then call the rest of the code. And now let's see some example of fuzz data provider, because this is what we use mostly in TensorFlow. So what we have to do is initialize the fuzz data provider with the data buffer and its size. And then as long as we have bytes, uh, remaining in the data in the fast data provider, we read some components of it. We call our API in each case consume leading digits, and then we check some property on the output. We can also use fast data provider uh, on Python. In this case, we hid it under the fuzzing helper class 
because we have we discovered that in most cases our API either receives an integer list or an integer or a float list or a list of tensors and so on. So all of this has been created in Fuzzing Helper such that users need to write as little code as possible to fuzz the specific operation. Okay, now that we are done with fuzzing, let's consider the next scenario that we use at Google to identify security issues, code uh, uh, vulnerabilities and so on. This is mutation testing. What we do in this case is there is a system that looks at the AST of the code and mutates some condition. So for example, if developer writes the code on the left, this system might detect that I have a condition on the if branch and negate it. If this results in some unit test failing, then this mutate, mutation is considered detected. If at the end of the mutation testing period, there is at least one mutation that has not been detected by any unit test, then the developer would receive a warning such that they can use to see if they, if they write a code that has no effect. Okay, another feature that we use to, this one is mostly once we have a vulnerability, how we fix it at scale, is to use Clang based tools. And there are two options here. One of them is to use Clang tidy checks. So we know that developers are prone to using, to writing code that showcases this particular code weakness. So for example, accessing elements outside of bounds of some array. We can write a Clang tidy check that as soon as code is submitted for review, will detect this code use indexes two arrays in parallel and doesn't check that these two arrays have the same size. So it's possible that the indexing would be outside of bounds. Let's warn the developer such that they would insert the check. Or the other option is to use ClangMR refactoring, where let's say I have an API. So for example, this is a real scenario that happened some years ago. There is this API shard that receives a function to do the work at the end. So basically it distributes this work across multiple workers in a thread. The work function receives two int64 arguments. However, in a lot of cases, by mistake, developers have written, they have called the API with a function that received int arguments. Because of the width difference, it happens that in some scenarios, the function can write outside of bounds of array, can result in or can do overflows or can run into infinite loops. In order to fix all of these scenarios, we used ClangMR to detect all of the wrong cases or all of the wrong calls of shard and automatically rewrite them into the proper calls. Okay, another tool that we use for security in a TensorFlow is to do some validation for the models. So as I was saying that we have the option to save the model into a saved model format, which is a protobuf in TensorFlow. But TensorFlow also has TensorFlow Lite. TensorFlow Lite saves the model into flat buffers, which is a different serialization format from protobuf. Flat buffers offers uh, the developer the possibility to write verify type functions, where you are specifying conditions between tables in the flat buffer. A save model into the flat buffers format for TF Lite is represented on the image on the right. So basically we have a model a table that contains a buffer arrays, which basically contains the memory allocated for each tensor. And then there is a subgraphs array that points into a subgraph table where we have for each uh, table, we have the tensors, the inputs, the outputs for the operations and so on. And for each tensor, we have a buffer element, a buffer index that should point back to the buffers into the model table. And all of this indexing could be altered by on the, since it's fi a, sci a file saved on disk, it could be altered by a malicious user. So with verify, we can detect at load that all of the indexing is valid. And only then, if all of the indexes is valid, then the model is returned to the runtime and can be executed, can be passed input and generate output. While here, we are also trying to develop TensorFlow using layered APIs. Uh, there are cases where we have to deal with untrusted inputs and there are three ways to do that. One option is to report them via check. Check is a macro that is basically an assert. If the assertion is failed, if the condition is uh, false, falsified, 
the check results in a program termination. The check is similar to check but only in debug mode. Outside of debug mode it's a no op. Both of these, check and decheck, are useful only in a small number of scenarios because they don't report something useful to the user. Instead, what we should do if the input comes from the user is to return status or status or t, where we can return either a status or a t value. In this case, we can use the type safety that C++ allows us to have a layered API, where the internal code parses the untrusted input and maybe, the ex sorry, the external layer, the public API has a validation layer which parses the untrusted input and returns the status to the user in case of error. And then if the input is valid, then we call the internal code where we assume that all the validation is safe, is completely done, that all the input is good. And if we, we want to get some stack traces for the cases where this is not true, we can use checks or dechecks. There is a similar talk, a similar blog article called Parse Don't Validate. It's about Haskell, but the structure basically it represents splitting your API into splitting your code into two layers. One layer for the parser, where you continuously parse the input and add structure to it, or a validator that just reports the input failed to parse or passed the entire parsing and is valid. While here, we can also discuss about parsing differentials. Basically, parsing differentials or shotgun parsing is, sorry, shotgun parsing is where you parse just a little bit of the input, then you do some operation, then you parse a little bit more of the input, do a little bit more of operation and so on. This makes you prone to parsing differential attacks where you have two different parsers for the same input and they treat exceptional cases differently. So I can give an example in TensorFlow. We used to have this uh, API called TF image decode image that was implemented in a bad way. So basically what would use what would happen? TF image decode image would call the decode image function in Python, which would look at the first three or two bytes uh, of the buffer to see which type of image it is. So if the first three bytes would be FFD8FF then the image would be JPEG and it will call a Python function called decode, decode JPEG. In some of the cases, before calling the decode underscore type of image function, there would be some validation that for the number of channels in the image, so the number of colors is in one of the formats that were expected. Once the decode functions in Python would be called, the glue between the Python operation and C++ operation would be executed and we'll have two C++ operations that would be called. So decode JPEG, PNG and GIF would call the decode image op, whereas decode BMP being older would call the decode BMP op. And then in C++ layer, the two decode operations would do different checks in the constructor and then in the compute. In general, each different branch does different things in different orders. and What's important is to notice that, for example, the number of channels is checked again both in the constructor and in the compute function, the header is parsed again, and so on. So, because the Python parser and the C++ parser are not always in sync, it is possible to parse an image from Python as JPEG, but that image actually to be BMP, and then cause uh, issues at runtime. So. We eliminated all of this partial differential by making the Python function decode image call just one single C++ operation decode image op, which from the beginning would switch to the type of the image that we are looking at, would parse the complete header, would always do a size check to make sure that the output tensor has the proper sizes, would do all of the other checks for the number of channels and the colors and so on, and then finally would decode the rest of the image. Basically, APIs could be viewed also as formal languages, where the strings that the formal languages accept are the valid APIs, the valid order that the user could call the APIs. It is very hard to validate the APIs because of Turing completeness and also because of uh, Hiram's law, which results from le leaking implementation details. 
but it should be possible. And here I would recommend the Science of Insecurity talk from many years ago from a security conference. And these are some resources from everything that has been discussed into this uh, slide. And uh, I can leave the floor now for questions. Uh, thank you very much.